Chapter 6 Mina Murray's Journal 24th July Whitby Lucy met me at the station, looking sweeter and lovelier than ever, and we drove up to the house at the crescent in which they have rooms. This is a lovely place. The little river, the Esk, runs through a very deep valley, which broadens out as it comes near the harbour. A, vi a great viaduct runs across, with high piers, through which the view seems somehow farther away than it really is. The valley is beautifully green, and it is so steep that when you are on the highland on either side, you look right across it, unless you are near enough to see down. The houses of the old town, the side away from us, are all red-roofed, and seem piled up on one another anyhow, like the pictures we see of Nuremberg. Right over the town is the ruin of Whitby Abbey, which has sacked, which was sacked by the Danes, and which is of the scene of a part of Marimon, which where the girl had built up on the wall. It was a most noble ruin of immense size and full of beauty and romantic bits. There is a legend that a, a white lady is seen in one of the windows. Between it and the town there is another church the parish one, round which there is a big graveyard, all full of tombstones. This is to my mind the nicest spot in Whitby, for it lies right over the town and has a full view of the harbour and all the uh, all up the bay to which the headland called Kettleness stretched out to the sea. It descends so steeply, steeply over the harbour that a part of the bank has fallen away and some of the graves have been destroyed. In one place, part of the stonework of the grave stretches out over the sandy pathways far below. There are walks, with seats beside them, throughout the churchyard, and people go and sit there all day long looking at the beautiful view and enjoying the breeze. I shall come and sit here very often and work. Indeed, I am writing now with my book in my knee and listening to the talk of three old men who are sitting beside me. They seem to do nothing all day but sit up here and talk. The harbour lies below me, on, the, on which on the far side one long granite wall stretching out into the sea, with a, curve out, with, with a curve outwards by the end of it, in the middle of which is a lighthouse. A heavy stone wall runs alongside outside of it. On the near side, the sea wall makes an elbow crooked inversely, and it ends, too, with a lighthouse. Between the two piers there is a narrow opening in the harbour, which then suddenly widens. It is nice at high water, but when the tide is out, it shoals away to nothing, and there is merely the stream of the Esk running between the banks of sand with rocks here and there. Outside the harbor on this side, there rises for about half a mile a great reef, the sharp edge of which runs straight from behind the southern, the southern lighthouse. At the end of it is a buoy with a bell which swings in bad weather and sends out a mournful sound in the wind. They have a legend here that when a ship is lost, bells are heard out in the sea. I must ask the old man about this. Oh, he's coming this way. He's a funny old man. He must be awfully old for his face is all gnarled and twisted like the bark of a tree. He tells me that he's nearly a hundred and he was a sailor in the Greenland fishing fleet when Waterloo was fought. Here is, I am afraid, a very skeptical person. When I asked him about the bells at sea and the white lady in the abbey, he said very brusquely, I wouldn't fashion myself about a miss. Them things will be all worn out. Mind, I don't say that there ever was, but I do say there wasn't in my time. There be all very well come for comers and trippers and the like, but not for a young lady like you. Them's feet folk from York and uh, Leeds be always eating, curling up herons and drinking tea and looking out to buy cheap jet with creed all right. I would myself be bothered telling them lies to you, even the newspapers which were full of faux fool talk. I thought it would be good. I thought he would be a good person to learn interesting things from, so I asked him if he would mind telling me about the whale fishing in the old days. He was just selling himself to begin when the clock struck six, whereupon he labored to get up and said, I must gang Margaret's home, miss. My granddaughter doesn't like it to be kept waiting. 
when the tea is ready, for it takes me time to camel a boon the greens, and there be many of a mine, miss. I like belly timber, surely, as the butter crock. He hobbled away, and I could see him hurrying as well as he could down the steps. The steps of a, are a great feature of this place. They lead from the town up to the church. There are hundreds of them, I do not know how many exactly, and they wind up in a delicate curve. The slope is so gentle that a horse could easily walk up th and down them. I think they must have originally been had something to do with the abbey. I think I shall go home too. Lucy went out visiting with her mother, and they were only and they, as they were only duty calls, I did not go. They will be home by this. First August. I came here an hour ago with Lucy, and we had a most interesting talk with my old friend and the two others who always come to join him. He is evidently the Sir Oracle of them, and should I think they must have been in his time a most dictatorial, dictatorial person. He would not admit anything and downfaces everybody. If he can't get, if he can't out argue them, he bullies them, and he and takes their silence for agreement with his views. Lucy was looking sweetly pretty in her white lawn frock. She has gotten a beautiful color since she's been here. I noticed that the old men did not lose any time in coming up and sitting near her when we sat down. She is so sweet to old people. I think they all fall in, fell in love with her on the spot. Even my old man succumbed and did not contradict her, but gave him a, gave me a double sneer and said, I got him on the subject of the, of the legends, and he went off once again in sort of a sermon. I must try to remember and put it down. It be all fool's talk, slug stock and battle. That's what it be, not else not else. These buns are whiffs of bold ghosts and ghasts and bulgs, and all ant em to seem fit in bars and dizzier women been our brethren. They be not but all bulls. They are all grims and signs and warnings, all be invented by parsons, all illsome beg bodies and railway trotters to seek a scamming hofflin and to get folks to do something that they don't incline to do otherwise. It makes me ireful to think of them. Why, it's them that, not content with printing lies upon paper and preaching to them out the pulpits, do not want to be, be cutting them on the tombstones. Look here around you and see what I'll tell you you will. All them steens hovering up their heads as well as they can be with their pride all askant, simply tumbling down with the weight of the lies they write upon them. Here lies the body, or the sacred to the memory, or a wrote in all of them, and ye half and ye nigh half of them be in bout to nobodies at all, and the memories of them can't be cared for to pinch a spot of snuff, much less scay sacred. All oh, lies about them, nothing but lies of one kind or another. My God! And it'll be a quaint scrounderment on the day of judgment when they come tumbling up in their deaf sharks, all jumped together trying to drag their tombstones with them to prove how good they were. Some of them trimming and detrimenting with their hands and their dooseling and slipping and from lying in the sea where they can't even keep their grip on them. I could see from the old fellow's self-satisfied air and the way in which he looked around for the approval of his cronies that he was showing off. So I put in a word to keep it going. Oh, Mr. Sauls, you can't be serious. Surely these tombstones are not all wrong. Joblins! They may be poorish frill for not wrong, saving when they would make out the people too good, for there be folk who think a bomb, and a bomb bowl be like the sea, if only be their own. There, the whole thing be only lies. Now look, you're here! You come here, stranger, and you see this kirkgather. Gather, I nodded as I thought I would be it would be a, to assent, though I did not quite understand his dialect. I knew it was something to do with the church. He went on, and you constat that all your strands of be a boon folk that happen to be here snod and snug. I assented again. Then that just may be the lie that comes in. Why, there be scores of these lay beds to be tombed in old Dunn's blacker box on Friday night. He nudged one of his companions, and they all laughed. And my gorg! How could they have otherwise? Look at that one there, best that's destined to blast in a blender bank. Read it! I went over and read. Edward Spencerler, Master Mariner, murdered by pirates off the coast of Andretti's, April... 
1854, age 30. When I came back, Mr. Swalls Mr. went on, Who brought him home, I wonder, to hap here? Murder of the course of the Andres, and you consent to consolate his body lay under. Why, I could name you a dozen bones laid in the green than seas above. He pointed northward. And where the currents may have thrifted them. There be the stands about ye. Ye can, with ye young eyes, read the small print of the lies from here. That's Biffra the Lorry. I knew how his father lost in the lively of the coast of Greenland in twenty, or Andrew Woodhouse drowned in the same seas in seventeen seventy seven, or John Paxton drowned off Cape Farwell a year later, or John Rowlands, whose grandfather sailed with me, drowned in the Gulf of Finland in fifty. Do you think these men would have to make a rush to Whitby where that trumpet sounds? I have me old Arthurums to boot it. I tell ye, when they go to here, they be Jonlin and Jocelyn in one way or to look at it be, and be fighting up all upon the ice in the old days. When we be from one another to the daylight to dark, and trying to tie up our coats by the light of the Aurora Borealis. This was evidently local pleasantry, for the old man creaked over and his joints joint in joint in gusto and his cronies joined in gusto. But I said, surely you are not quite correct, for you start in on the assumption that all the poor people or their spirits will have taken their tombstones with them on the day of judgment. Do you think it would be really necessary? Well, what else do they be having the tombstones for? Answer me that, miss. To please their relatives, I suppose. <laughs> to please their relatives, you suppose? This he said with instant scorn. How would it be pleasure their relatives to know that lies is written over them, and that everybody in the place knows the, the lies? He pointed to a stone at his feet, which had been laid down as a slab, which on which, uh, on which the seat was rested, close to the edge of the cliff. Read the lies of that Thurfenstein, he said. The letters were upside down from me, from what I sat, but Lucy was more than opposite of them. She leaned over and read, Sacred to the memory of George Cannon, who died in hope, in hope of a glorious resurrection on July 29th, 1873, falling from the rocks of Kettlesness. This tomb was erected by his sorrowing mother for her dearly departed son. He was the, he was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Really, Mr. Sauls, I don't see anything very funny about that. She spoke her comment very gravely and somewhat severely. You ought not, you don't see it ought funny? <laughs> That's because you don't be going into the Soto's mother's was a haircat that hated him because he was a skewed, a regular lamenter he was, and he hated her so that he committed suicide in order that she might get an insurance he, she put on his life. She blew nigh the top of his head off with an open musket that he had been scoring the cat the scaring the crows with. Twent for the twent for his mother so pious that she was sure go to heaven and he didn't want to addle where she was. Isn't that stern at any rate? He hammered it he hammered it with a stick as he spoke. A pack of lies And who would it be Gabriel Kennel when George when George did come planting up the greens with the tombstone balanced on his hip and asking to be taken as took as evidence? I did not know what to say, but Lucy turned the conversation as the, she said, rising up. Oh, what? Why don't you tell us then? It's my favorite seat and I cannot leave it. And now I find I must go on sitting on, on the grave of a suicide. That don't harm ye, my pretty. And it'll make poor and old Judgy Gramestone to have so trim a lash sitting on his lap. That won't hurt ye. Why, well, I've sat here off and on for nigh twenty years past, and it ain't done me no harm. Don't ye flash about them lies under ye, or don't, no, that doesn't understand the lie that is there. It'll be time for ye to be getting scat when ye see the tombstones all running away, and the place be bare as a stubber field. There's the crook and I must be gang. My service to ye, ladies. And off he hobbled. Lucy and I sat for a while, and it was all so beautiful before us that we took hands as we sat, and she told me all over again about Arthur and their coming marriage. This made my heart a little sick, for I have not heard from Jonathan in a whole month.
that same that same day. I came up here alone, for I was very sad. There was no letter for me. I hope there cannot be anything the matter with Jonathan. The clock has just struck nine. I see the lights scattered all over town, sometimes in rows where the streets are, and sometimes singly. They run right up the esk and die away at the curve of the valley. In my left, the view is cut off by a black line of roof from the old house next to the abbey. The sheep and lambs are baying, are bleating in the fields away from me, and there is a clatter of donkey hoof prints in the paved road below. The band on the pier is playing a, ha I hate, a harsh waltz in good time, and further along the quay there is a Salvation Army meeting in the back street. Neither the bands hear the other, and upon, uh, but up here I hear and see them both. I wonder where Jonathan is, and if he's thinking of me. I wish he were here. Dr. Seward's Diary, 5th June. The case of Renfield grows more interesting and the more I get to understand the man. He has certain qualities, largely developed selfishness, secrecy, and purpose. I wish I could get at what the object of was the other ladder. He seems to have some settled scheme of his own, but what it is I do not know yet. His remedying quality is his redeeming quality is a love of animals, though indeed he has such curious turns that it is sometimes hard to imagine that he is only abnormally cruel. His pets are of an odd sort too. Just now his hobby is of catching flies. He is, the, he is at the present in such a quantity that I may have to find myself to expostulate. To my astonishment, he did not break out into a fury as I expected, but took the matter quite in simple seriousness. He thought for a moment and then said. May I have three days? I shall clear them away. Of course, I said that that would do. I must watch him. 18th July. He has turned his mind now to spiders, and has gotten several very large big fellows in a box. He keeps feeding them his flies, and the number of the latter becomes so sensibly diminished that although he has used half of his food in attracting more flies from outside the room. 1st July. His spiders are now becoming a great nuisance, as his flies, and today I told him that he must get rid of them. He looked very sad at this, so I said that he must clear out some of them, at all events. He cheerfully acquiesced to this, and I gave him at the same time, before, uh, as before, for reduction. He disgusted me much while with him, for when a horrid blowfly, bloated by some carrion food, buzzed through the room, he caught it held it exultantly for a few moments between his fingers and thumbs, and before I knew what he was going to do, put it in his mouth and ate it. I scolded him for it, but he argued quietly that it was good and very wholesome, that it was life, strong life, and gave life to him. This gave me an idea, or the rudimentary, or the rudimentary of man. I must watch how he gets rid of his spiders. He has evidently some deep problem in his mind, and for he keeps a little notebook in which he is always jotting something down. The whole pages of it are filled with masses of figures, generally single numbers added up, in bat added up in batches, and then the totals added up in batches again, as if though he were focusing some account, as the auditor would put it. 8th July. There is a method to his madness, and the rudimentary idea in his mind is growing. There will be a whole idea soon, and then, oh, unconscious celebration! You will have to give it all the wall to your consciousness, brother. I kept away I kept away from my friend for a few days, so I thought I might notice if there was any change. Things remained as they were, except that he had parted with some of his pets and gotten a new one. He had managed to get a sparrow and had already partially tamed it. His means of taming is simple, for, he, uh, for already the spiders have diminished. Though and th and those that do remain, however, are well fed, for he still brings in flies for the tempting with his food. 19th July. We are progressing. My friend now has a whole colony of sparrows, and his flies and spiders are all but, but obliterated. When I, came, and when I came in, he ran to me and said he wanted to ask me a great favor, a very, very great favor. And as he spoke, he fawned on me like a dog. He asked, I asked him what it was, and he said, with a sort of rapture in his voice and bearing, A kitten, a nice, a playful, sleek, playful kitten, that I can play with to teach and to feed and 
feet and feet. I was, I was not unprepared for this request, for I had noticed how his pets went on increasing in size and vivacity. But I did not care that his pretty family of tame sparrows should be wiped out in the same manner as the flies or the, and the spiders. So I said I would see about it, and asked him if he would rather have a cat than a kitten. His eagerness betrayed him as he answered, Oh yes, I would like a cat. I only asked for a kitten, lest you should refuse me a cat. No one would refuse me a kitten, would they? I shook my head and said at the present I feared it would not be possible, but I would see about it. His face fell, and I could see a warning of danger in it, for there was a sudden fierce, sightlong look that meant killing. This man is an underdeveloped homicidal maniac. I shall test him with his present craving and see how it works out. Then I shall know more. 10 p.m. I visited him again and found him sitting in a corner brooding. When I came in, he threw himself on his knees before me and implored to let him have a cat. That was his salvation depended upon it. I was firm, however, and told him that he could not have it, whereupon he went without a word, sat down, gnawing his fingers in the corner where I had found him. I shall see him early in the morning. 20th July. Visit Renfield very early, before the attendant went about his rounds, found him up and humming a tune. He was spreading out his sugar, which he had saved, in the window, and was manifestly beginning his fly-catching again, and, be being it, and beginning it cheerfully and with good grace. I looked about round for his birds and not seeing them, asked him where they were. He replied, without turning around, that they had all flown away. There were a few feathers about the room, and on his pillow, a drop of blood. I said nothing, but went and told the keeper to report to me if there, were anything, if there was anything odd about him during the day. 11 a.m. The attendant had just been to me to say that Renfield has been very sick and, di and dis had disgouged a whole lot of feathers. My belief, doctor, my belief is, doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds and that he has just took them and ate them raw. 11 p.m. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight, enough to make him sleep, and took away his pocket uh, pocketbook to look at it. The thought that had been buzzing around my brain lately is complete, and my theory proved. My homicidal maniac is of a peculiar kind. I shall have to invent a new classification for him, and call him a Zophavagilus life-eating maniac. What he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, and he has laid himself out an archive in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider, and many spiders to one bird, and then wanted a cat to eat that many birds. What would have happened in his later steps? It's all, it would almost be worthwhile to complete the experiment. It might have, been, it might have done so if there was a sufficient enough cause. Men sneered at vivisection, and yet look at its results today. Why not advance science in the most difficult, way, difficult and vital aspect, the knowledge of the brain? Had I for even the, the secret of one such mind, did I hold the key to the, fan, to the fancy of even one lunatic? I might advance my own branch of science to a pitch comparable to with which Burgeon Sanderson's psychology or Ferrier's brain knowledge would be as of nothing. If only there were a sufficient cause. I must not think too much on this, or I may be tempted. A good cause might turn the scale with me, for may not, for may not, I be too of a in inceptional brain. Congeniality? How well the man res reasoned! Lunatics always do within their own scope. I wonder how many lives he values a man, or if, and if at all any one. He has closed the account most accurately, and today began a new record. How many of us began a new record for each day of our lives? To me, it seems that only yesterday that my whole life had ended with my new hope, and that truly I begin a new record. So it will be until the great recorder sums me up and closes my letter account with a balance of profit or loss. Oh, Lucy, Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor can I be angry with my friend whose happiness is yours. But I must wait on hopelessness, hopeless and work, work, work. If only I could have a strong cause for my poor mad friend there, a good, unselfish cause to make me work. That would be indeed happiness. Mina Murray's, Mina Murray's Journal 26 July 
I am anxious, and it soothes me to express myself here. It is like whispering to oneself and listening at the same time, and there is also something about the shorthand symbols that make it different from my writing. I am unhappy about Lucy and about Jonathan. I have not heard from Jonathan in some time, and was very concerned, but yesterday, dear Mr. Hawkins, who was also kind to me, sent a letter from, from him. I had written it asking about him if he had heard anything, and he said the enclosed was just received. It was only a line dated from Castle Dracula, and said that he was just starting for home. That is not like Jonathan. I do not understand it, and it makes me uneasy. Then too, Lucy, although she is so well, has taken to her old habit of walking in her sleep. Her mother has spoken to me about it, and we've decided that I am to lock the door of our room every night. Mrs. Westerra had gotten an idea that sleepwalkers always go on to roofs of the houses and always on the edges of cliffs, and then suddenly waken and fall over with a despairing cry that will echo all over the place. Poor dear. She is naturally anxious about Lucy, and she tells me that her husband, Lucy's father, had the same habit, that he would go up in the night and dress himself and go out, if he were not stopped. Lucy is to be married in the autumn, and she is already planning her, out her dresses and how her house is to be arranged. I sympathize for her, for I do the same. Only John and I will start our life in a very simple way, and I shall have to try and make both ends meet. Mr. Homewood, he is the Honorable Arthur Homewood, the only son of Lord Gromling, is coming up here very shortly, and soon he will, can leave for town. Or his father is not very well, and I think Lucy is counting the moments till he comes. She wants to take him up to the seat of the, of the churchyard cliff and show him the beauty of Whitby. I dare say that it is waiting which disturbs her. She will be all right when he arrives. 27th July. No news from Jonathan. I am getting quite uneasy about him, though I should say I do not know why, for I do, do wish he would write if only for a single line. Lucy walks more than ever, and each night I am awakened by her moving about the room. Fortunately, the weather is so hot that she can't get cold, but still the anxiety and the perplexity began waking is be being awakened is being to tell on me, and I am getting nervous and wakeful myself. Thank God Lucy's health keeps up. Mr. Homewood has suddenly called in to ring to see his father, who had been taken seriously ill. Lucy frets, at the postponement of seeing him, but it does not touch her looks. She is a trifle stouter, and her cheeks are as a lovely shade, lovely rose pink. She has lost that anemic look which she used to have. I pray it will, uh, it will all last. August 3. Another week is gone, and no news from Jonathan, not even to Mr. Hawkins, for whom I have heard. Oh, I do hope he's not ill. He surely would have written. I look at the last letters of his, but somehow it does not satisfy me. It does not read like him, yet it is his writing. There is no mistake of that. Lucy has not walked much in her sleep in the last week, but there is an odd concentration about her in which I do not understand. Even in her sleep, she seems to be watching me. She tries the door and finds it locked, goes about the room searching for the key. 6th August. Another three days and no news. The suspense is getting dreadful. If only I knew where to write to or where to go to, I should feel easier. But no one has heard a word from Jonathan since that last letter. I must only pray to God for patience. Lucy's more excitable than ever, but is otherwise well. Last night was very threatening, and the fishermen said that we are in for a storm. I must try and watch it and learn the weather signs. Today is a gray day, and the sun, as I write, is hidden behind thick clouds, high over kettleness. Everything is gray, except for the green grass, which seems to seems like emerald amongst it. Gray, earthy rocks, gray clouds tinged with the sunburst at the far edges, hang over the gray sea, in which the sand ports stretch out like gray fingers. The sea is, tr is tr tumbling over in the shadows and the sandy flats with a roar muffled in the sea's mist drifting inland. The horizon is lost in the gray mist. All is vastness. The clouds are piled up like giant rocks. And there is a broil over the, the sea that sounds like the, some presage of doom. 
dark figures are on the beach here and there, sometimes half shrouded in the mist, and seem men like walking trees. The fishing boats are racing for home, and rise up and dip in the ground well swell that they sweep up into the harbor, bending the scrubbers. Here comes old Mr. Old Sauls. He's making this straight for me, and I can see by the way he lifts his hat that he wants to talk. I have been quite touched by the change in the poor man. When we sat down beside me, he said in a very gentle way, I want to say something to you, miss. I could not, I could see he was not at ease, so I took his poor wrinkled hand in mine and asked him to speak fully. And so he said, leaving his hand in mine, I'm afraid, my dearie, that I must be shocked by you of all the wicked things I've been saying about the dead and, and the like for pa weeks past, but I didn't mean them. And I want you to remember when I'm gone. We old folks that be daft with one foot a draft in the knocker hole. Don't go altogether like that to think of it. And we don't f want to feel scared of it. That's why I took to making light of it. So that I cheer up my own heart bit. But Lord love you, miss. I'm afraid of dying. Not one bit. Not only do I not want, do I, not only do I want, don't want to die if I can help it. Time must be nigh hen, for I be out. A hundred years is too much for man to expect. I'm so nigh of it that the old man is already wet in his life. He I cannot see I get now the habit of caffin' about it at once at all. The chafes will wag as they used to. Soon, some day, the the angel of death will sound his trumpet for me. But don't ye fear drool about on green me, dearie. For he saw that I was crying. If he should be coming this very night, I will refuse his call. For life be, after all, only waiting for something else than what we're doing. Death be all that we can rightly depend on. But I'm content, for it's coming to me, my dearie. I'm coming quick. Maybe coming while we be looking and wondering. Maybe it's in the wind over the seas that is bringing with its loss and wreck and sore distress and sad hearts. Hey, look, look, he cried suddenly. There's something in that wind, and in the hoist beyond the sounds, and looks and tastes and smells like death. It's in the air, I can feel it. Lord, Lord, make me answer a cheerful way when my time comes. He held up his hands dutifully and raised his hat. His mouth moved as if he were praying. After a few minutes' silence, he got up, shook hands with me, and blessed me, and said, Goodbye and hobbled off. It touched me. It upset me very much. I I was glad when the Coast Guard came along with his spy glass under arm. He stopped to talk with me, as he always does, but all the time kept looking at a strange ship. I can't make her out, he said. She's Russian by the look of her, but she's knocking about in the queerest way. She doesn't know her mind a bit. She seems to be it seems to see the storm coming, but can't decide whether to run for the or up north in the open or to put up in here. Look there. She stared mildly strangely, for she doesn't mind the hand of the wheel. Changes were about with every puff of the wind. We'll hear more about her before this time tomorrow.